outlook currently is happening on Japan equities is simultaneously as a near unanimous consensus agreement of normalizing policy and exiting radical easing. How do you reconcile those two? Anyone that watches Japan and follows it understands the importance of the words they choose. So let's talk about what normalization means in Japan. Moving to positive doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but the message it sends is incredibly powerful. We are now in the positive interest rate game. There are ways you can repatriate funds to Japan as the largest overseas creditor in the world that will change the flows of just about everything in finance, the direction of travel that that reassessment of that capital deployment is going to take. It is going to be towards Japan. People don't believe the Bank of Japan yet, and with very good reason. They don't believe them that they're going to start to hike the front end. They don't know what normalize is. The difference that will make in capital flows going to be unfathomable to a lot of people, but it's going to be very, very real. Bank of Japan remains important, but Japan is changing. People need to understand that and understand what it means. What it means is significant. The bull case or the sort of bullish outlook currently that's happening with especially the foreign community on Japan equities that is happening simultaneously as almost a near unanimous consensus agreement of Japan is going to be normalizing policy and exiting this like radical easing um not necessarily like tightening per se but how do you reconcile those two happening at the same time I'm not talking about just you specifically I mean just in general are they bullish Japan equities despite the bank Japan's normalization um, expectations or are they doing it perhaps because of as in they're now going to actually make Japan less of a heavy handed market and there's going to be an interest rate or something like that and it's going to kind of become more normal in that sense how, how do you reconcile those two near unanimous consensus views taking place I think it's a really key question um, and and the reason this is important is as you said Japan Bank of Japan have signaled and they, you know, Kuroda-san stepped down, Ueda-san came in, so that gave them the perfect chance to change policy when they changed governor. And they've been very uh, active in talking about this idea of normalization. Um, you know, in typical Japanese fashion, they haven't put numbers on it, they haven't put timelines on it, but anyone that watches Japan and follows it understands the importance of the words they choose. Um, so let's talk about what normalization means in Japan. To me, and other people may view it differently because you do have to interpret, it means rates are going to go higher. It doesn't mean they're going to go to 6% because Lord knows what would happen in Japan if that happened. Rates as in, because there's two policy rates in Japan because they took that 10-year yield too and made it a policy rate. Yeah, what? I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the policy rate, not... not okay, negative um, rate. But Right, so negative 10 basis points, right? And they've been there for a long, long time. And again, I've spoken about this before, but if you think about moving from negative 10 basis points to positive 10 basis points, right? Let's say they, might, they, they raise 20 basis points and they're positive 10. That doesn't really affect things. It doesn't, it's not going to suddenly make anybody change the way they think about accessing capital. It doesn't make a huge amount of difference. But the message it sends is incredibly powerful. It says that after years of having negative interest rates, we are now in the positive interest rate game. And interest rates in Japan don't need to get too high before an awful lot of capital will start coming home to the bond market and to the equity market. Those, those interest rates will attract people to the bond market um, particularly when we get the, you know, the, the, the pension fund, money market funds. I was talking about this recently, you know, which they, they're going to set, they think in March, they reckon they'll be set 75 basis point returns. So if base rates are 10 basis points, 20 basis points, and so they get them up there, in the scheme of things, it's not something that is going to cause people who look at the numbers to have a fit. But for people who look at the messaging, it's going to be incredibly powerful. And so suddenly... Japanese capital can come home in its domestic currency so it doesn't suffer the degradation that the yen has played into that over the years. You know, if you look at hedged returns, um, and, they can, and they can invest money domestically in bonds that will give them the yield that they're promising their stakeholders quite easily with no currency hedge necessary. And they have this equity market, which is not going to suffer from high rates you know, the, the equity market is not going to suffer if interest rates go half a percent. But it's a massive change in the bond market. It's a massive change for the currency. 
And, you know, when the yen, talking about saying specific ideas, when the yen was at 150, I wrote a piece and said, this is one of the most asymmetric bets I can think of. Being long the yen, when everyone's selling it at 150, given what the Bank of Japan have said, right? There's a time I'm very happy to say, this is an asymmetric bet. Because from 150, there's a very limited distance this will go lower before the Bank of Japan's forced step in. They've already stepped in little toes to say we're here. But it, the chance for appreciation if this interest rate policy changes is immense. And it moved 10 bips in the space of a month. Of course it did. But the other thing that I think people need to understand about Japan, which is really important, is that if the MOF, the Ministry of Finance, who work very closely with the Bank of Japan, go to the big funds and say, hey, we need you to bring capital back home. We need you. We are the biggest credit nation in the world. You've been making all this money overseas. We need you to bring some money back home now. You and I both know that will be done. This is not a question of, no, no sorry, Moff, we're not doing that. Well, they, they already have to buy JGBs home. by regulation anyway, so it's just an extension of that. Right, no. right. So that, so that money's going to come home. And you know, today, there was a, did you see the story about Alzora Bank? I just wrote up a a sub, I Azura, just published right? a subsec on that, yeah. Right, so you know, right? stocks down twenty percent on U.S. commercial real estate losses, mm -hmm. and so you know, if you've got an awful lot of money invested overseas in real estate, and it's in a clear bubble and it's struggling, guess where you can invest money in real estate at a pretty decent level that hasn't had a crazy, crazy, crazy run like a lot of stuff has in the U.S. There are ways you can repatriate funds to Japan as the largest overseas creditor in the world that will change the flows of just about everything in finance. You know, everybody is technically short the yen through the carry trade. Just about everybody has a short yen. They don't even realize it. Yeah, a natural, a so, natural short carry right. trade as we, yeah. Right. And so, so this changes. This, 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 this word, normalization, without being specific, it changes the way important people, and by important people, I mean um, people who have control over significant amounts of capital, think about where to deploy that capital. And you have to be aware of that and you have to realize the direction of travel that that reassessment of that capital deployment is gonna take. And it is gonna be towards Japan. And, and people haven't seen that yet. And you can see that people don't believe the Bank of Japan yet. And, and with very good reason, right? With very good reason. They don't believe them that they're going to start to hike the front end. They don't know what normalize is. Remember when we said j will never get rates to 3% before he blows the market up? Remember, we all thought, I mean, we all believed that, all of us. We said, there's absolutely no way this functions at 3%. Well, we got to. And this is the same with the Bank of Japan. And it doesn't have to get to 3%. If the Bank of Japan can get to 1%, the difference that will make in capital flows is going to be unfathomable to a lot of people. But it's going to be very, very real. And so that's, that's why I think the Bank of Japan remains important, but for a very different reason. It was important in that everyone looked at it as the vanguard of monetary policy. And as when Japan, so would go the world. And there's these famous charts with his Japanese policy with a 20-year lag over whatever it is. And it's exactly the same. I get that. But Japan is changing. And that's also going to matter. And so I think people need to understand that. And, and again, do the work to understand what it means. Because I think what it means is significant. Yeah, I, I agree. Because uh, what people, I guess this might, this might be loss of translation, but when... Governor Ueda talks about this specific thing. They actually don't talk about the, I guess the West refers to it as um, removing the negative interest rate and then getting into positive, you know, raising raising interest rates. So there's a very ECB, Fed, Bank of England sort of yep. way to, to say it. The way that they talk, they, they literally say it is uh, a world in which there is an interest rate. That's how they say it. Correct. A world Correct. in which there's an interest rate. That could mean, that could actually even mean, um, if they bring up the zero, so this is out of negative, but it's not a positive, it's in this kind of limbo state, they could stay there. Like they bought themselves with optionality and flexibility, and they could probably stay there for a long time. But the interpretation will be like, here comes the Japan rate hiking cycle for, that's been a long time coming for like you know, 20, 30 years or something like that, right? Uh, but right. let me ask you then, but, what but about. But there's, but Weston, wait, yeah. but there's, there's yeah. one very important sure. distinction to make here with when you talk about the ECB and the Fed, mm. and this comes back to this Japanese equity market, right? The way the, the Fed and the ECB and the Bank of England, for that matter, and the RBA in Australia and the RBC in Canada, all, the way they talk about rates, they are talking to the stock market, right? They are talking about hiking rates and cutting rates. They're not talking about we're going to move our policy rate. 
we're going to adjust our policy rate, which is much more Japanese in its neutrality. We're going to adjust our policy. There will be an interest rate, right? They are sending a message. We are going to cut rates because they want people in that mindset that rates are going lower. Not that they're going to adjust, not that they're going to be sensitive to data and, and adjust the policy rate accordingly. The market is hanging because it's been such an equity culture for such a long time now. Mm. They want to hear the central bank is going to cut rates because that rings a bell in what happens to equities after that. And so what you said to me about the Japanese is exactly right. There will a world where there is an interest rate, 10 basis points, 5%. They've got all the flexibility in the world, but they're signaling that we are moving. And because Japan hasn't been an equity culture, they don't have to send a market that will calm nerves in the equity market, that will stimulate animal spirits in the equity market. And that's a really important thing to understand. Yeah, um, certainly. But then, so let me ask you about the, this a potential limitation. Is this this cloud overhanging of, um, by the way, Aozora, Aozora Bank. Aozora in Japan, Japanese means blue sky. Um, and that's, right. that's a very apt. Uh, they're, they're actually the, um, I just wrote about this, but when Lehman went bankrupt, they were actually listed as the number one unsecured <laughs> creditor to Lehman of, in, in all, of all entities. Um, and so that's their history. But um, forget the financial system and stability and all that. What about 206% debt to GDP ratio of the world's most indebted yeah. government who is – who, if they have borrowing costs go up by 100 basis points, if the Bank of Japan did what the Fed did or the ECB did in the last two years, then more than 100% of the, the government's yeah. budget would go to servicing interest. On, or, or, serv or servicing debt, existing debt. Um, how do you reconcile that? I mean, there is that kind of need to, and we can call it manipulation of, you could call it destruction of capitalism. I have totally agree with that. But the fact is that Japan can default on itself or it also has the choice to not. Um, and it seems like if you own more than half of the supply of the government bond market for which you've now structurally destroyed in terms of trading liquidity and all that kind of stuff. How, how do you reconcile a normalization in terms of removing of radical, you know, policy accommodation with the fiscal side, which has been enabled, if not just outright blindly just went further into debt, knowing that the BOJ has the explicit put option um, for that side of the moral hazard? And can they allow that to come, those chickens to come to, to roost? Well, I, I've, I've spent way more time than I should have thinking about this, obviously. And you're right, right? Mm -hmm. it's, you, you think about it and think it's ir irreconcilable. But what the Fed have taught us is that talking in absolutes around monetary policy um, is a very dangerous thing to do. You know, if X, then Y is not guaranteed to happen or certainly not in the, in the time frame you think about it. i mean think about qe1 think about tarp and qe1 the equation then was if tarp and qe1 then inflation right that was absolute consensus opinion if you do this we're going to inflation is going to get out of control and it did 15 years later right so this if then if, they, if the Japan, Bank of Japan start raising rates, then everything goes poof. There's a very strong case for that. But it's as strong as the case for if the Fed raises rates to 3%, the system will break. Equally strong case. And so being aware of the structure of the Bank of Japan's debt, being aware of the constraints which they have is important. But understanding what they're trying to do and watching how they do it and again, doing the work to stay connected and understanding what they're doing and, and how that's affecting capital flows, particularly because the kind of money that could come home from overseas from Japan could be a significant tailwind in terms of unwinding those bond holdings, right? Significant tailwind. Um, it, it, it's really important to understand. So is it irreconcilable? Yes, it is. But does that mean that if X, then Y? Maybe in 15 years it does. But what are 15 years they've been in, in US markets if you've just said, okay, I understand that that is a distinct possibility. Um, and look, I've learned this lesson the hard way. I've learned this by, I was absolutely in the if QE1 and TARP, then inflation camp. Absolutely I was. Um, and I, so I've learned this. I've learned this by having 
convictions about things that I should have held more loosely. And I've learned and I've adapted that framework. And, and that's the important thing, right? Um, the Bank of Japan is the same, but very different. And you have to recognize that and understand that nothing is set in stone. And we don't know what's going to happen. We know what a certain course of action is likely to lead to, but we all search for absolutes and we all want to have this if X then Y equation settled in our heads so we know what happens when that happens. And it's just not that simple. And so I think, I think certainly given the distance Japan can go in moving its interest rates, which in absolute terms is tiny, you know, 60 basis points is not a huge move, but the change that that will bring to capital flows into Japan will be massive. And so, you know, I, I've been one of the sternest critics of the Bank of Japan I know, and I've talked and written and presented about this many, many times, about highlighting, look, this is insanity, and it is insanity, and it has been insanity, and it remains insanity. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean necessarily that the second they go to positive rates, the whole thing falls over. Oh, yeah. Clearly it doesn't mean that because we've seen, we've learned that from the Fed. So you're absolutely right to flag it. It is irreconcilable and it's something that anyone investing in Japan has to be acutely aware of. But is it a clear and present danger to the base investment case for Japan? I don't think so right now. Yeah, I actually wasn't meaning it that way uh, if it came off that way, but I was actually th thinking like maybe, you know, as you were saying, there's so many possibilities. The one thing that I know for sure is that I cannot, I cannot in good conscience make a, in six months, they will be doing X, Y, Z. You don't know that. They are very market dependent by policy. The nature of the policy is so market dependent. If you can tell me what's going to happen, the market looks like, if you can tell me where 10-year JGB yields are going to be in six months, where dollar yen is going to be, where it's so on and so forth. But if you're just saying it because that's the kind of Western formula and sort of chronology of things, you're, up, you're misapplying things uh, and unknowingly so. But uh, what I was thinking was, okay, so if they start to let rates liberalize or, you know, normalize higher in a higher rate environment and all that and kind of reflect a little bit more so of market realities, then to your point, if that attracts the trillions that Japan has in fixed income markets overseas, brings it back home, plus you have two quadrillion in household financial assets, half of which is in cash, therefore basically the half that's in cash in Japan mattresses actually can cover the outstanding amount of JGBs as is. And so if you allow for a nominal yield to exist in Japan back home, maybe that in itself will actually fund and cap YCC upon itself via domestics if they do it in a measured, well-communicated sort of way. I could see that lifting rates could actually get them out of or kind of not have to just keep monetizing government debt as it is, as a potential right. sort yeah, of... Exactly, exactly right. Or, and or it could blow up. <laughs> nuance. But yeah, absolutely right. Both, both outcomes are, are possible. The, the trick is handicapping the probabilities, not the possibilities of both, because they are both on the table. But there's a, there's a nuance to this you know, market-dependent thing. There's a very important nuance for people to understand, and that is, yes, they are market-dependent, but they've signaled that our intention is to go higher. So now they're looking at the data very differently. They're looking at this from the perspective of, does this data allow us to raise rates? Not, does this data mean we have to keep rates low? And it's, it's, it's a very subtle shift in mindset, but it's a really important one. Because if they're, if they're on the fence now, whereas they would have kept rates low, if they're on the fence, they're probably gonna raise them. I think, well, actually, not sure. We want to go higher. We're market dependent. The market might be giving us room to do it. So let's try. So they've completely shifted their mindset and investors have to do that too. Full circle, I guess. What would you look for, let's say, uh, when, you're, when you would be getting out of Japan? You're not actively trading. These are long buy and holds stocks and, and names in Japan. So you don't care about like kind of day-to-day -day fluctuations as it is. But let's say, you know, you've made significant gains. Um, Japan performed uh, for the reasons that you said it would perform. We're talking like years down the line. What's going to cause you to lighten up the load? I don't want to say take chips off the table because I don't want to make it sound like you're trading and gambling or something like that. What would it be? It's actually, it's actually very straightforward for me. Um, and then the to be clear, the corporate government thinks was just one thing that I thought was important because it signaled a shift in attitude. And I think that's important to know that corporate culture in Japan is changing. 
But for me, it's it's very simple. Value. If I if I if I don't see value in Japan anymore, if all the value gets eaten away and it becomes about price, you know, that if you want to make money in markets, it's very simple. Buy things that are undervalued and sell them once they get overvalued. It's a really simple way to make money. It's difficult though, because the things that are undervalued are by definition out of favor and nobody wants to own them. So you have to do your work and you have to buy things that everyone else says, oh, don't buy that, it's, it's garbage. Really difficult. And it's difficult at the other end too, because when things are overvalued, I mean, everybody wants to own them and you're the only idiot selling. But it is a surefire way or as surefire as they can be to make money. You know, Like I said, price and value. Price is what you pay for something, value is what it's worth. And if you can buy for something, buy something for less than it's worth, even if you sell it for what it's worth, you made a profit. If you get other people who are coming in saying, hey, we've got to own this thing, and they do what equity investors always do and overvalue them, then it's time to sell. But you have to be willing to do the work. Yeah, I keep coming back to this idea of doing the work and understand the company, and understand what value is. And yes, value is subjective. One man's value is not necessarily another man's value, but we can look at metrics. We can look at, you know, there are, there are things we can look at as benchmarks, whether it's price to book, whether it's sales, whether it's price earning, whatever it is that you decide is your arbiter of value, at least there are ways to look at it and say, okay, within my framework, this falls into the value bucket. It's undervalued. And I am happy to own that below its value and hope to sell it for value. And if not, overvalue. And if the story changes, the story changes around the company, this is why doing the work is important, its value changes. That value might come down. You might think, geez, I've got to sell it. It's fine, right? You're never going to get more right. So for me, I, I, I want to be in Japan because I think there's value there. And if I start to see overvaluations, I'll exit. And, and I'm, I don't have FOMO. I'm very happy with people to run these things up, and that's great. But I, I, I love to find things that are undervalued and hold them and sell them when they're trading for more than they're worth. It's, it's a, like I said, as, as, as solid a way to make money as I've found in, in my career. So you're defining value. Not a share that you want to – is this not a share that you like at that price? Is this a business that you want to be an owner of? Mm -hmm. Do you think other people – are placing less value on this through the share price than what the business, the underlying business would suggest. And if so, I want to own those companies. And so long as that company is creating value as you define it, then you're, you're a happy owner and- um, it Executes? Yeah, uh, ex executes. But then if take SoftBank before they became like a buy the top take a tech investor of all time, uh, they were just a telecom company. Um, happy to buy that or oh, then suddenly they switch to that that's no longer the value proposition that I got in for so that would be an example of what, how you define sure. value has I'd, I'd, changed I'd, and I'd miss out on well look I, I would I would look at I would look if, if Masasan said on one day which he didn't obviously I'm going to completely change this here's what I'm going to do I would look at that new business case and say does that business case hold water and the chances are I would have said no that's not why I bought this company and I'd have sold it and I'd have been wrong no, well, I'm okay I, I, with that. I don't I, think you'd no, be I'm wrong. I'm okay with that. I've been wrong. I'd have been wrong from a price point, and everybody would look and said, "I can't believe you sold SoftBank there." When look what it's done since then. And based purely on price, you'd say, "Yeah, if I'd held them, I would have made a lot more money." Yeah. But I bought them here; they were valued down here. I sold them; they were overvalued. I made my money, and I'll leave the speculation to other people. That's totally fine. I don't but think you that's have wrong. To be okay yeah. with that. Yeah, I don't think I don't, I don't think that's wrong. Or the reason that you want you have ownership. No longer exist. So you're free you're out. That's, I don't think that doesn't matter what the price is after that. It would be wrong for you to, I think, just blindly stay in for reasons that you didn't get in for, for you know, for, for in the first right. place. Yeah. So, um, okay. Uh, William Sun, this has been an absolute treat for me. I'm taking up way too much of your time here. Um, thank you so much. I guess, do you, do you have any message to anyone who's looking at Japan either from a interested in buying Japan equities or a looking at the Bank of Japan, their generational shift that's underway, or the Ministry of Finance and their foreign currency market intervention yeah. from all of your decades of experience on the ground, looking at it, and then you're getting back in sort of broad advice or anything like that that we could take away from, or that I can take I'm away. I'm very from. happy to share. It. Yeah, I don't know that people are necessarily going to like it because it involves doing more work, which I think is so important. But two things: read and understand. Read about Japan, read about the past, understand the changes that have been made, understand the position that the Bank of Japan are in, understand the capital flows, understand what uh, 
slightly higher rates mean. Understand the yen carry. You know, there's a lot of things you need to do here because no one's had to look at Japan for 25 years, really, unless they were Japan focused. So most people, unless they've been Japan investors, are starting off at a massive informational disadvantage. And so the best advice I can give you is close that gap. Read, ask questions, find people who are Japan focused and ask them questions. You can do that on social media quite easily now. Um, but arbit arbitraging that informational disadvantage is going to work really well for the people who are focused on it and really poorly for those who aren't. And so you need to close that gap. Brilliant. Um, understand that Japan is significant <laughs> again. It is. Yeah. yeah, well, it, it hasn't been, but it, it will be again. Thank you so much. This has uh, been a, a real treat um, and a real honor. And I truly genuinely appreciate this, not just your time and, and all that, but I mean, I'm talking about for years going back, following you. And uh, you certainly, you made a massive impression on uh, in a positive way and you continue to uh, on me personally. So I just really want to thank you for this. this has been an absolute honor. Um, and hopefully we can get you back on should these kind of dynamics change here and take a look again and uh, revisit. I'll be happy to. Weston, thank you. The place has been all mine. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, good luck with everything. Thanks so much, grandson. Arigatou gozaimashita. Doitashimashite. If you come to Japan, let's get a nama beer. You bet. Yeah. Before a dollar yen crashes. Yeah, I listen, I need to do it while, while it's so cheap to go there. I need to do it quickly because I think it's going to get more expensive. I hope so. I think you should. There you go. All right. All right, buddy. Thanks so much. Gani. Yeah. <laughs>